Hi, it's Tom from Lone Horizons, and it's that time again. We're back with our peasants, and we are going to continue exploring level one of the Hilltop Ruins, aka Dyson's Delve. So what are we doing? Last time we killed the last couple of goblins and goblin, uh, sorry, hobgoblin boss in room six. You can see that, okay, uh, which is here. So they looted 5,000 silver pieces from him and a few electrum pieces as well. So I've distributed those amongst them now. And the next thing to do is maybe head through room five, room four, down this corridor to room seven, I reckon, up here. Now I'm gonna house rule that when they're going, when they're backtracking through places they've already been in the dungeon, we don't need to spend ten, a full 10 minute turn sort of checking for traps and cautiously creeping ahead quietly, not attracting attention because you know, they've, they've already been through here and they know that there's no traps there or they didn't find any anyway. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna house rule. I don't know how everyone else does this. You can let me know in the comments, but I'm gonna say that they can move two rooms per turn when they're backtracking because I'm doing the movement rules by um, room rather than distance uh, when they're not in combat. So that means they'll go in one turn to room five and then to room four. And that is gonna be that turn there done. Next turn they have to do a wandering monster check and rest and also Groban's torch will go out at the end of that turn. So let's do the wandering monster check. Nothing. I didn't move their little sticker here. There we go. So yeah, no wandering monsters. They need to rest for the... Oh, so that means they rest for the whole turn. They can't do anything else. So at the moment they're there, and then that means next turn it will take the whole turn to get to room seven. That's fine. And yeah, Groban's torch is going out, so let's see if he has another one that he can just light. Let's find Groban. This is him here. Torch times two. Okay, so he's now got one torch left. rub out the times two so it just says torch and he is now carrying another torch so do that Groban again and yeah so that was that turn done and then it's gonna take another turn to get to room seven okay so since we don't have to do wandering monster checks. Uh, actually, I'll, I won't cross it off yet because the turn is still in progress. Let's try and be logical about it. Okay, so if we have a look at the description for room seven. Descent, uh, yeah, there's stairs down to the next level here. Two goblin rat catchers and their, their pet giant ferret are coming up the stairs from level two. The two doors to the south, that's these two I guess, are barred from this side with crudely painted skulls in black paint on them. Okay, maybe uh, suggesting what's to come down south. So we've got two goblin rat catchers and their pet giant ferret that they used to catch rats with I suppose. As they're goblins, I'm not gonna do a reaction table roll for them. We are just gonna attack them straight away because our guys just hate goblins and they, they want to get rid of them. They want to clear out the whole of this dungeon. So there are none left. So in that case, we will need to get into the combat. Okay, so we're ready for the encounter. No one was surprised. I've rolled for initiative off camera while I was setting it up. Uh, so here we go. We've got Gonithil's group, then Goblin 2, then Goblin 1, then the Ferret then Lessim's group and Cater's group. The two goblin rat catchers both have five hit points and the giant ferret has six hit points. So yeah, uh, Gonophil's group gets to go first. Let's just 
put the die there as a marker. So that means who's first there? Gonathil then. Oh, and Gonathil is the one with the falcon. We don't have a name for the falcon yet. We really need to name the falcon, don't we? So uh, the he can use the falcon as a ranged attack, can't he? Because, yeah, that was what we decided last time. Okay, so where is he? Gonathil is here. We are, the room is 60 feet wide. And because, if we look at the map, because they're coming up from the stairs in the west corner over there, I've just decided that we've kind of assembled ourselves on the other side of the room over there. So there's 60 feet distance between us. Humans and elves can move uh, 30 feet per turn, so they could get to the middle. Um, halflings and dwarves can move 20, so around about there. The goblins can move 20 as well. What about the giant ferret? 30, like a human. Okay. So, uh, in that case, Gonithil, what does he have? Oh yeah, he has his falcon, so why doesn't he make a ranged attack first then? Or he could move and attack as well. So yeah, let's, let's move him into the center, his full 30 feet, because he's an elf. So yeah, the uh, uh, falcon we said will do d4 damage and have a plus one attack bonus. So let's roll for that. Oh, he rolls, he gets six because he rolls five. What was the goblin? Oh yeah, the goblin's armor class is 10. So the falcon swoops over there. I didn't even say who I was attacking, goblin one and misses. Okay. It's been a few days since I played this, since I played any RPG actually. So I'm a bit rusty on combat rolls, but I'll get back up and running shortly. Okay. so. Who's next in Gonathil's group? It's Groban the rope maker with his hand axe and his minus two attack bonus. Okay, so Groban is a human, so he can move to the middle. The two goblins aren't even gonna be able to get to the middle uh, on their turn, are they? That's pretty good. Walton, the noble with a long sword, he is gonna do the same thing. Let's move him to there. And Duin, the elven forester, he is here, so he's going to do the same thing. Move up there. I mean, I'll put them all together in a group because it kind of doesn't matter. Because we're not doing grid combat anyway. Okay, so that's Gonnafil's group done. And it is now Goblin 2's turn. All he can do is charge forwards. He doesn't have a ranged attack or anything. He can't order the ferret to go forward before him. He'll just go 20 feet, which would be about two thirds of the way, I suppose. And he will end there. Then Goblin 1 is going to do the same thing. And then it's the giant ferret. The giant ferret can move 30 feet, so he can actually come and attack one of these guys. Let's roll to see who he goes for. We'll just go one, two, three, four. Two, so he attacks Gonathil. Okay. Now, oops, that's, that's not the right die. Uh, the giant ferret, what does he do? He has a plus two attack bonus and he does 1d4 plus one damage. Okay, he's not messing around. Gonathil's armor class is 11. So he gets 14, 15, 16, so he hits and uh, he does, wow, the maximum damage. Five damage to Gonathil. So, oh, Gonathil was on two hit points. He is killed. So the giant ferret leaps at him and bites his neck deeply, completely tearing out his throat and killing him in one go. <laughs> That is a shame. I really liked Gonathil. Oh, I, was, I had high hopes for him. And I think we're going to have to say that his falcon f gets spooked, basically, and flies off, flies away, never to be seen again, unfortunately. So, R.I.P. Gonathil. You fought well. Okay, so then it's Lessim's group. Let's see. Lessim is the cheesemaker who has a long sword. His attack bonus is minus two. When these guys level up, 
I hope they get a bonus to their attack to their attack once they're level one. That will really help because otherwise they're going to be so bad at fighting. Anyway, so uh, wait, what's Lessim doing? He's back here actually. So he can move 30 feet and reach the giant ferret. Okay, that is good. So he is going to attack the giant ferret. They, I'll put them like that to show that they are now in combat. So what is the giant ferret's armor class? I'm just trying to turn him the right way up there. Armor class 13. Wow, he's, he's quite tough. And Lessim's attack bonus is minus two. Okay, so that means he needs to roll an 11 to hit. Oh, and he does 1d8 damage with his longsword. An 11, 9, no. Uh, he misses the, the giant fairy, nimbly jumps out the way of the sword. <coughs> so then, after Lessim, it's Ugmus, the dwarven mushroom farmer, with his shovel. So he can only move 20 feet, so he's going to go to about there. Then Heva, she can attack with her sling. So maybe she should go for the giant ferret because it's... Oh, but the giant ferret is in melee combat with Lessim. And on the last video, someone called Silver Surfer pointed out the rule for firing into melee, which is something like that if the shot misses, there's a 50% chance that it will hit someone standing next to them, which would be one of our guys here. So. I'm not going to go for him, I'm going to go for Goblin 1 with Heaver's Sling. Okay. So, Goblin 1's attack, oh, sorry, armor class is 10 and Heaver's attack bonus is plus 1. So, if she rolls a 9, she will hit. 15, yeah, she hits. And <laughs> her Sling does 1d4 minus 3 damage. Oh, but how? what's the distance? 30 feet. Oh, that's fine. That's in short range. So I think, I think short range, she doesn't get a bonus or penalty to her attack with the sling. Let me see. Uh, no, it's just, just neutral. Okay. Yeah. So she, she hits it, but she does 1d4 minus three damage, always doing a minimum of one. So she just does one damage to the goblin one. The sling bullet slams into his chest, bruising him. So that was Heaver's turn. Okay. So then it's Cater's group next. So that is just Cater and Orsia. Cater is the fortune teller with her pitchfork. She's over here, so she can run 30 feet and get up close to the giant ferret. Okay. So Cater, she does 1d8 damage and has zero attack bonus. Okay, she's going to stab at the giant ferret with her pitchfork. It's got armor class 13. Okay, so 13 to hit. 11. Oh, she misses. Damn it. Okay. And then Orsiet has a sling. So she she's going to go for Goblin 1 as well. So her attack bonus is 0. So that is um, same range, so she just needs a 10, 10 to hit, okay. And she does 1d4 minus 1 damage. 14, and she rolled a 4, so she does 3 damage to Goblin 1. Her sling bullet smacks him right in the face, cutting his face quite badly, and he is now on 1 hit point. Okay. Um, so now we go back up to Gonathil's group. This is good. We're all getting a, a, a few, we're getting a few hits on them in between their turns, which is very nice. So Gonathil is dead actually. So it's now Groban's turn. Um, hand axe one d six minus two, and his attack bonus is also minus two. And he who's he attacking? Where is he? Groban down here. So he is within range of the giant ferret as well, so he can attack it. Armor class 13, uh, so he needs to roll a 15 to hit it. 12. Oh, it jumps out the way of his hand axe. Okay, Walton. 
he is now in melee combat as well. He has got a long sword, uh, attack bonus of zero, so he needs to roll a 13 as well. Three, it's terrible, we're doing really badly. So it dodges out the way of Walton's longsword. Okay, Dewin with his staff, where is he? He he did make it all the way, yeah. Oh, because he's a, he's a, an elf. I keep thinking Dewin's a dwarf because I just think Dewin is a dwarfy name, but uh, he's actually an elf. So Dewin is going to attack with his staff. He needs a 13 to hit as well, and he will do 1d4 damage if he hits. Critical, amazing, okay. So yeah, and uh, he did four damage with his, with his critical. Let's see what he does. Okay, so just remember we need to use the luck modifier on this roll. What do you in what is his luck modifier? Zero. Hardly any of them actually have a luck modifier at all. So we will roll a d4 and we'll add the result to the four, is it four? Yeah, four damage that he's already, already doing. Four. Okay, let's see. Uh, all zero level character. Strike to foe's kneecap. Inflict plus 1d4 damage with this strike and the foe suffers a minus 10 foot penalty to speed until healed. Okay, that's great. Okay, so uh, let's roll for that damage. So we've got four plus four, eight, eight damage and it's killed. Okay, he so basically he swings the staff at uh, the, the giant ferret's leg and it cracks the knee, cracks the knee, breaking his leg completely. Um, the giant ferret falls to the floor and then he cracks it on the head again um, and kills it in one mighty blow from his staff. Okay. <laughs> That is great. So um, I'm just gonna make a note that Dewin killed it because I wanna update the character sheets with the most powerful enemy vanquished because I love doing that. Just always done that ever since playing Baldur's Gate as I'm sure I've already told you. So yeah, the giant ferret is now dead. And it is now, whose turn is it? It is now the Goblin Goblin 2's turn. Okay, so Goblin 2 is gonna reach them now. There are one, two, three, four, five of them there. Oh, we've got a D5, haven't we? Because we're playing Dungeon Crawl Classics. Let's see. That is, that's not a D5, that's a D7. I'm still not used to the funky dice that this game uses. Just trying to, there we go. You can shout at the, shout at the screen when you see it. <laughs> If you can see this. Ah, uh, this is it. No, that's the D7 again. I can't believe it. Just picked up the same die twice. Okay, D5, D5. There is one, right? Yes. This is a D5. Okay, finally. Could have just rolled a D6 and re-rolled if it was a 6. So anyway, this is, yeah, Goblin 2. He approaches the centre of the room. And who does he go for? Let's find out. One, Dewin. Okay. He's going for revenge against Dewin for killing the um, giant ferret, <laughs> right? Okay, so Goblin to uh, his attack bonus, oh, is minus one, and he rolls a, oh, ah, uh, yeah, I haven't actually said what weapons they've got. Uh, they normally do one d4 to one, like, like they normally have 1d4 weapons, like a staff or a, or a dagger um, or a club or something. Um, it does say minus one melee 1d3, which I think is a bite. Yeah, a bite attack, they do. So um, why don't we roll for them, actually? Why don't we roll a d6 uh, for both of them? And on a 1 to 3... Let's say on a one to two they're unarmed, and on a, the rest of the die they have daggers. Let's see. So the green one will be goblin one, yellow goblin two. Okay, so they both have daggers. Just write that down there. So they will both do. 
Weapon minus one melee damage. So it will be 1d4 minus one. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, minus one attack bonus. Duin's armor class is 10. Okay, so he needs to roll an 11 to hit. And here's his damage die. 12. It hits. And it does two damage because it rolled a three. So Duin... Oh no, he has one hit point. Dewin is killed as well. Ah, oh. so the goblin basically charges across the room, roaring in rage as it sees its its pet get killed, and just lunges, jumps through the air with its dagger pointing towards Dewin, and stabs him right full on in the chest, taking him down. Oh dear. So that was Dewin the Elven Forester. We're running out of elves. Let's <laughs> go. Yeah, uh, both the elves are dead now, so <laughs> there's, what have we got? We've got a dwarf and the rest of us are humans. All right, it's not going to be a very diverse party then, is it? All right, let's, yeah, get rid of Dewin there. He is now gone. R.I.P. Dewin. And that was Goblin 2's turn. So next it's Goblin 1. He can now reach the centre of the room. I'll roll a d4 to see who he attacks out of these four. Bless him. Okay. There we go. So, uh, Lessim's armor class is 10. Okay, so the goblin needs an 11 to hit, and it's going to do 1d4 minus 1 damage. 16. He hits. Uh, he rolled a 1, so that means he does 1 damage to Lessim. What is Lessim's hit points, though? One! <laughs> Lessim is taken out as well. The goblins are kind of rallying now. Um, they're getting bolder and bolder uh, as they're killing more and more of our peasants. So that goblin just does the exact same thing, charges at him and stabs him in the, in the heart and takes him out. Okay, so yeah, we're really... This is a very unlucky fight compared to the last one we had. The last fight was pretty easy compared to this. Okay, so yeah, so that was Goblin 1. So it's now Lessim's group's turn. Uh, this is now Ugmus's group, which is just Ugmus and Heva. So Ugmus is, is the dwarf. He is now catching up and he's going to go for Goblin 1. Let's see. Goblin 1 has only one hit point left. Um, so hopefully he can kill him. Ugmus has a shovel, he's got attack bonus minus one. And so he just needs an 11 to hit. Okay. 11, exactly, okay. And he does 1d4 minus one damage. So he does one damage to Goblin One and kills it. So he just whacks it in the face with the shovel <laughs> and brains it and it crumples to the floor dead. <laughs> so that was Agnes killed that one. Okay, good. Goblin one is gone. He's an ex-goblin. Only goblin two left now. Oh, so um, goblin two on his turn, he will need to do a morale check. Let's remember that. But first, Heaver gets to attack goblin two with her sling. So, yeah, attack bonus plus one, so she needs to roll a nine to hit. Five. She completely misses. The bullet just sails past the goblin and probably bounces down the stairs at the end of the room. Ah, oh, I need to actually keep track of their their ammo, don't I? So I think Heva has shot twice and Orsia has shot once. I'm just going to, rather than check how many bullets they've got left on their character sheets. I'm just going to put a two and a one there for how many times they've shot. It's fine as long as I know what it means. Okay, so next is Kater's group. So that's Kater and Orsiet. So Kater is here attacking Goblin 2 with the pitchfork. So wait, what's Kater's attack bonus is zero. Okay, so she needs a 10 to hit. 18, okay, and she does three damage. That is a good 
good hit. So she jabs the pitchfork into the goblin's stomach. Does three damage to him. And then Orsiet with her sling. She needs to roll a 10. Four, okay, another miss. Bullet flies down the stairs again. Okay, so that is another another shot from Orsia. And then next we have Gonithil's group before Goblin 2 gets a chance to do his morale check. Okay, so that is Agmus then with the shovel. Okay, let's just move move everyone closer to the Goblin so we can just make sure it's obvious what's going on. So Agmus has a minus one attack bonus, I think. Yeah, so he needs to roll an 11. Six, ah, a miss. The goblin manages to um, jump out the way of the, of the flying shovel as it swings through the air. So then now it's Heva. Oh, and I, I totally forgot about that rule about firing into melee combat. I think since we've lost so many people now, I don't want to risk hitting anyone even with a small stone from a sling. So Heva is going to go 30 feet into the center of the room and join in this fight. And, um, oh, she needs to change weapons then. So switching to her melee weapon uses an action. So that will be her action for the turn. Let's see what that is. Heva's melee weapon. Uh, oh, she doesn't have one. Okay. Oh, right. Well, she can try punching. Um, I, in the rules, because I just checked, they do 1d3, 1d3, like, subdual damage when they punch people, um, meaning if they get reduced to zero hit points from that kind of damage, they just get knocked out rather than killed. And it's modified by their strength bonus, as usual. Anyway... She's put her sling away, and next time, if he's still there, she'll attack him. So that was, uh, yeah, Gonithil's group. So then now it's Goblin's two, Goblin 2's turn, and he needs to make a morale check. So what does he do? Uh, how does he do that? I've forgotten. Let's see. Morale. Let's see. Roll 1d20 and add the creature's will save, and they have to roll 11 or higher. Okay, I was supposed to do it when the first creature was slain as well. The giant ferret, but I forgot. Anyway, so their will save is minus 2. So if they need to get, uh, if they need to hit 11, that means it needs to roll a 13 to survive the will check, the, the morale check. Three, no, the goblin screams and runs away down the stairs. We'll say that, uh, oh look, he, can't, he actually can't make it all the way. So we could, we could like chase, up, chase him down and kill him. But to be honest, it doesn't really matter because we're gonna get experience points for surviving this encounter anyway. And he could, you know, there are gonna be more goblins in the dungeon. So as far as I'm concerned, he can just sort of disappear into the into the pool of enemies of wandering monsters and lair monsters and things that we're going to encounter anyway. So that is that encounter over. The goblin has run away and we have survived, but we lost Lessim, Gonifil and Duin. OK, um, so do the do these goblins have any treasure? Does it say that on here? Let's see. Descent. No, and when when other goblins have money and stuff, it says what they have. So I think we have to assume that no, they do not have any treasure. Okay, so in that case, uh, the fight is over. Let's just deal with the ammo from the slings. They both shot twice. So I will just adjust that for Eva and Orsiet. Okay, so they've still got loads of stones for their slings. Okay, so looking at the experience points rules again, I think this this encounter warrants four XP for everyone. 
because this says an extremely difficult encounter, one that the party barely survives, multiple character fatalities, significant character damage and potentially a retreat of some kind required. Okay, and, and three XP says possibly even a fatality. So I think with three fatalities, like a third of the group being killed and the others just about making it, I think that warrants four XP, which means the surviving characters, they are all on six XP, which means that they will now reach 10. And that is the requirement for level one. So they are actually leveled up into proper, proper heroes, proper adventuring heroes with special character classes and abilities and everything that comes with that. So that is really, really nice. And I think um, I am going to do that in the next episode so we can really get into it and spend a bit of time choosing spells and things like that, everything that you have to do. We'll do it all in one go in the next episode. After I said bye and ended the episode, I realised I should probably do some kind of breakdown of this delve into the dungeon. So that was delve one. It lasted one day, started on day one, ended on day one. And the party killed four giant ferrets, six goblins and two hobgoblins. They found 5,000 silver pieces and 53 electrum pieces and the party had 10 deaths. So based on what I decided when we started the campaign, I think we're going to say the peasants will be able to get home from the dungeon safely and we'll start them off in town next time where we'll level them up and probably buy them some better gear, weapons, armour, things like that. So I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.